Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Hacker 2024. Day two for some of you, but of course, some of you are joining us um, newly for just for the day. So welcome to you too. Um, you did miss out on a great day, but hopefully you can catch up on some of the content from yesterday too. Uh, so I'm Mahmouda. I work at I work at the strategy unit, and I'm one of the um, one of uh, a few people that have been sort of leading and organizing the conference today, supported by a few of the organizations that you'll see dotted around. Um, but welcome to online attendees as well, because we have got a massive online community joining us today too. So welcome to you. Uh, we're excited to celebrate the great work of health and care analysts. Um, and we've got lots of things to share with you through the day, lots of exciting sessions, workshops, so do catch them. I should tell you now that workshops aren't recorded. So if you do want to um, attend any, then today's your only chance to get into those. So before we start, I've just got a few announcements to make and a bit of housekeep, a few housekeeping items to cover. Uh, the first one being, if you haven't already checked in, where someone with a sort of pink lanyard has checked you in to, uh, via Eventbrite, please do so at some point during the morning if you can catch them at the registration desk. We know we had to sort of usher people into the room, so just please be sure to do that so we know um, who's attended and how many people we've got here today. So just some quick things about the venue to begin with which I'll put up on here. So on this floor, we've got the auditorium, the Iron Bridge room, the Wenlock room, which uh, will have presentations going on. And then we've got the Coalport room, which has some workshops as well. And then downstairs on the ground floor, we've got the Beckbury room, um, which is for presentations, and the Pattingham room for workshops as well. The posters area is next to the registration desk where, you, where you'd hopefully have all have seen or will see at some point today. That's also the area where we'll be having our refreshments, for, uh, refreshments during the breaks and lunch. Uh, so do um, familiarize yourself with that space. Um, we've also got along this corridor and downstairs the restrooms just in between the registration desk and the auditorium. Um, and downstairs, we've got some brilliant stands from all our sort of supporting organizations there. Uh, so do check them out and um, bag a freebie or two. Uh, some great stuff there and learn lots about those organizations too. They're really excited to talk to you. Uh, and we've also got some prayer facilities, a little room in the um, just next to the stands if anybody needs that throughout the day. Um, I should also say there's no planned fire alarm or test this morning. So if, you, if a siren does go off and there's a voiceover asking you to exit, then there are fire stewards that will sort of uh, direct us in where to, where to go. Um, or if not, then just follow the sort of running man, the green light. And the fire exits are at the bottom and we'll meet in the car park. Um, and they, we do have first aiders on site. So if you do have anything that you need during the day, just let us know. I have included on here, very importantly, the Wi-Fi. It's TIC UK, so please, please, please do connect to that because we will be using lots of Slido and Menti and things like that. So we will, if you haven't got sort of internet access on your phone, then uh, connect up now. It's really easy. You just need to click on the um, on that option when it comes up on Wi-Fi. Uh, and anything else you need, any help or support during the day, just go back to the registration desk, and we'll be more than Happy to help, that's what we're here for. So I'm just gonna cover what we've got going on in the digital screens. So on the digital screens dotted around, you'll see lots of QR codes. They've also got the program on there, the floor plan, so you can navigate your way around the rooms. Um, so just look out for those. And on, there's a few QR codes for today. So the first being, um, we have our most up-to-date program uh, available on this QR code. So there are a few printed copies, um, but uh, we've had a few changes. So the best thing to do would be to try and download the program from here. And there's a link on this program that takes you directly to the website for additional information about all the presentations. Uh, and it's also got a really helpful poster directory so you know what's available to look at there. And secondly, um, we want to hear all your thoughts and ideas running through your minds about your, well, not all of your thoughts and ideas running through your minds today, um, but any ideas you've got to sort of share with us, uh, then do share them on this Slido, uh, and we'll be picking them up through the day, and we're really looking forward to hearing some of your thoughts uh, about what you're thinking. And then we've also got do take the opportunity to connect with other people via our hashtag. So it's hashtag hacker2024. We're on all the socials. Um, so we'll be picking up those and responding there as well. So just give people a, a couple of moments to take that down. 
And then the third one for now, because there will be a fourth, for now is Q&A for all the sessions is via Slido. So if you um, all take this um, down now, because it will be through the day, but it's the same Slido for all of the sessions. So if you've got any questions through the day, you can just navigate between the rooms on this Slido and it'll, um, it'll give you options to ask questions for your session. Um, just give you a couple of moments for that one. Okay. I think that's it for our sort of digital screens. Um, I should say that we have transition times between the sessions. So you've got about five minutes to walk to your next session. So anybody that was in here yesterday, we do apologize. I think we went straight into sort of the next sessions, but we will try to honor that five minute to give you an opportunity uh, to move to your next rooms and um, navigate to, to wherever you want to go. I think that's it for those. Uh, and then, so um, now I will hand over. So. Thank you very much for attending today. We hope you have a great day and we're really excited to share all our content. Um, and I'm delighted to sort of present to you and introduce Peter Spilsbury, who's the director of the strategy unit um, and who's been really key in um, making this conference happen for two years in a row and hopefully will be key to sort of making it happen for a third year. So please join me in welcoming to the stage, Peter. Morning, everybody. Um, for some of you, welcome back um, to day two. For some of you, I think joining afresh. Um, some people um, only taking part in one of the days. So welcome to Hack 24. Um, uh, certainly, from a personal point of view, yesterday I thought was was terrific. I, thought, I mean, all the content that um, that I saw, I thought was was excellent. And I actually think also the venue and the whole way the thing's been run and organised, so professional. Um, and today is packed with loads more, so please take full advantage of it. And, and please, just a little plea, because I've been in this situation myself in the past, if you possibly can, please do stay to the end, because it's very miserable if you're one of the last speakers in the conference and half the audience has gone. So, so think of your colleagues who are presenting and try and be there for them, try and create an audience for those people in the last session of the day. Um, my second thing, please don't take Hacker for granted. Um, this has been quite a venture getting this going. Um, I won't bore you with the details, but, but the team I run, we, we're effectively partly subsidizing this at the moment because we, we believe in it. We've got some fantastic supporters for Hacker, um, the Health Foundation, um, the CSUs, NHS England have all provided funding so we can make this event available to NHS and care analysts, a professional national conference for those, for, for those groups um, and we can make it available as a, as a free to attend event. But we're going to have to keep making the case for that and as I said yesterday, please, please give us feedback. Um, it's so easy to ignore the feedback form. If you could give us some feedback about what value have you and the NHS and the care sector had from you attending this event? And if you possibly can, write me a little sentence or two that I can, that I can use as a quote in a document because I'm literally going to be going around waving the, um, the, the cup trying to get money for, for Hacker 25 and I need your help in that. Um, I could kind of stop there and Fraser would probably be pleased if I did, but I, I just want to take the opportunity because I think this is a really important platform um, to just make a plea for analytical quality and for a duty of candour, which seems to be an interesting phrase at the moment in government amongst for analysts. And I do this partly in the context of thinking about yesterday, where those of you who heard Anita Charlesworth talking about Clive Smee, he used to, I think he was the chief statistician um, in the Department of Health, who wrote a book called about, that talked about telling truth to power. So, some of you, some people like uh, Amanda Pritchard's statement about analysts. I, I'm a little unsure about it, but, but she said something like, a good analyst can save more lives than a good anaesthetist. So I've had several people mention this to me. 
during the conference. Now, now if good analysis can save lives, what does that tell us about bad analysis? So bad analysis for the right question, or good or bad analysis for the wrong question, has real consequences when the analysis we're doing drives decisions about how we use our resources for health and care. There's direct costs. So bad analysis can lead to something being promoted which has no value or worse. And it can create opportunity cost. It can lead to us doing things using resources that we could use better doing other things. And we're all part of this analytical eco ecosystem that drives those decisions. And, and, in, and in their best moments, people will say, we want to live in a world where the decisions we make about these things are analytically informed. You'll find thousands of policy documents that talk about that. So I just want to, just two things on the back of that, really. Just out of interest, in how many people in the room have read Jess Morley and colleagues' recent paper in BNJ, Informatics about risk stratification. Okay. So I think, I think there's a couple of things. First, we need to create a world where analysts have space to read because that, that systematic review is an extremely important publication about something that many analysts and analytical organisations are involved with at the moment which is the delivery of risk stratification for on a whole population basis in primary care. I won't bore you with the details, but that paper says, in the majority of cases, risk stratification leads to the opposite of what was intended. It leads to more emergency admissions, not less, or is associated with more emergency admissions, not less. It says, in a third of cases, there was a signal of harm And the reason why risk stratification is problematic is because apart from the issues about predictive power, the fundamental question of what intervention were we going to do that we thought might have the effect we intended has never been given the, intent, the attention it needed. And some fundamental concepts like the number needed to treat which play out in any kind of consideration of, of medications, for example, new drugs, got forgotten when it came to risk stratification. So we had people seriously developing plans that worked on the assumption that if we could spot people through risk stratification, we could avoid every single admission for every person we could spot. And completely forgot that the other consequence was we, that because of the notion of numbers needed to treat and because of poor predictive power, the consequence of risk stratification is that we will do lots of things to people who wouldn't otherwise have been admitted. Now, as analysts, we could have done more to have made the case in terms of critical thinking as to what, what were the issues in the thinking that lay behind risk stratification. Because risk stratification came in because it was very seductive for decision makers. It offered a real magical thinking opportunity and it was seductive because you could talk about algorithms and big data and all sorts of things which decision makers don't necessarily understand but find quite sexy. So analysts have got a really critical role to, um, to participate in that and to make arguments in those types of situations. And just to follow that through, if we're going to maintain analytical standards because it's a matter of life and death, if we follow Amanda Pritchard's, what should we expect... If there is a national initiative to introduce a new service model, what would we expect an impact evaluation of that to look like? What would we think should be the standards? Would we expect, so really critical, big national initiative, would we expect some sense of expected methodological standards in the work? Would we expect it to be peer reviewed? formally or informally? Would we expect the data on which the analysis was done to be published so replicability could be tested? 
Would we expect it to be done by organisation, commissioned from organisations that have established reputations and proven track record in doing that kind of work, of which there are many in the NHS and the think tanks and academe? I kind of leave that with you as a question. What, so what's the duty of decision makers and commissioners of analysis in the light of the fundamental observation by the chief executive of the NHS that bad an analysis can damage lives. And then, what's the obligation on us as analysts in terms of truth to power? What should we expect if we see bad analysis? Should we expect, should we have an expectation that we will raise that professionally, carefully? And what would we expect of those decision makers um, in terms of their response when concerns are raised? Um, so again, I ask you to think about that. We, li we live to some extent in a post-truth world and, and we have to uh, play our, our part in trying to address that. Speaking out isn't easy, but what I, I'm calling for, I think, is for analysts to be professional and bold, and sometimes work together, collaborate. You know, if you feel you can't call something out, then call a friend who might be able to help you. I've been called as a few times as a friend by people in that type of situation. Um, but then I really call, my main call is for decision makers, the people who commission important analysis, take responsibility for getting the question right, but take responsibility for making sure that the analysis is high quality and take that duty seriously. And I think the analytical community is fully uh, willing to work with decision makers who take that responsibility seriously. So, thank you very much. And now we've got an extra little thing that Charles is going to do with you, so I'll pass over to Charles. Hello everyone, I know we haven't got very much time for this because Fraser's already put stop up several times to Peter. He said he was speaking truth to power and speaking out. Um, so, over the last few years there's been quite a lot of pessimism, pessimism about the NHS. The Health Foundation's own work showed that when we asked people about how um, confident they were that services would improve over the next year, 53% they, they said they thought they'd get worse, 11, only 11% 11 said better. However, when I was in a networking event last night, um, there seemed to be quite a lot of optimism around about the future of the NHS. I suppose with the new government, new plans, um, new energy. Um, but I wanted to work out what that optimism actually meant. So we thought it would be very interesting to get the views of people in this room, people who are analysts, and we'd go about it in an analytical way. So we wouldn't just say, are you optimistic or not? We'd ask you to tell us where the NHS performance would be on three critical measures. So you're going to vote for this in, is it Slido? Menti. Okay, is there going to be something up on the screen? There's a clicker. Oh, here. What, do I go next? Okay, so three questions. It won't take very long. So the first one is, of course, A&E weights. In 23, 24, proportion of weights under four hours were 72 percent what's that number going to be next year 24 25 okay so 72 percent is that going to be higher lower and you need to put a number to it next question waiting list um in may 24 was 7.6 million cases what's it going to be in may next year Do I need to wait? Yes, please. Do I need to go back? No. Okay. Right, on to the next one. Final one. Okay. Only 24% of the public in 2023 were very or quite satisfied, according to the British Social Attitude Survey. That's run by Natsen. What proportion will that be in 24? And I think the survey, the survey is probably 
obviously it's taking place between near, now and the year end. Um, so those are the three questions. We're also thinking this is an inducement to come back next year because we're obviously next year we'll be able to tell you the results. Um, we're not going to tell you them before now, your predictions, but then next year we'll be able to show you how your predictions compared to what's actually happened. So that hopefully is an inducement to come back next year. There we are. Says that. Okay, thanks. <laughs>